housing affordability in 2023 has a chance to go down as the worst ever. There is more and more people calling for a housing crash, housing crisis. So we're going to go back and look at 2008. There's a lot of recency bias, lots of people thinking that we're going to just repeat what we did last time. And you know we bring on Dan Bird, the man with all the charts. He's going back in time, and he's going to tell us, are we set up for another real estate crash by looking at the charts, looking at the numbers? All right, Dan, what do you got? Yeah, not not just the charts, but but the reasons behind what happened in 2008. And it is a very complicated conversation. So I'm going to try to condense it all into 20 minutes. Um, but I would encourage people to do their own research and don't just go by what the crash bros out there say. Mm -hmm. um, but do your own research about what really happened in 2008, because it's very different from where we are right now. And I'll try to explain all of that, what, what, what did happen. And I'll show it some of the charts and then we'll get into you know the reasons behind it. Very cool. Thank you so, so much. Um, let me share my screen. And for those who did, weren't are part of the last session that we just did, if you want to get my newsletter, just go to breakpointtrading.net. And it's right there on the homepage. There's not, you don't have to register even. Um, unless you want to be reminded that the newsletter has been posted, then you, then you do have to register so that I have your email address. Mm -hmm. Um but it's right there. You can go out there and every week I put together, you know, a, a number of different things. I kind of pull things together from a variety of subscriptions that I have, as well as my own opinions and my own charts and that type of thing. So let's first, let's see, I want to start with some of my own charts from my website, just to kind of set the stage for the time frame that we're talking about. And Let's start with the 30 year fixed rate mortgage chart. This is, by the way, this is my, this is my website. This is the homepage on the website. And the charts page right here is the one that I usually spend a lot of my time on. And there's a bunch of charts in here. You can just kind of peruse those. But the 30 year fixed rate mortgage, this goes back 33 years. And it shows you not only the 30 year fixed rate, which is the black line, but also the 10-year treasury, which is the light kind of salmon line behind it, mm -hmm. you can see how closely those track each other, right? Mm -hmm. I also put the midpoint of that 30-year cycle right here. So you can see where we are. We're a little above the midpoint right now. Right. And then the, the light green one down here is the Fed rate, what the, what the Fed uh, interest rate was at the time. You can see right here the higher for longer, although they never called it that back then. Right. But they kept rates higher, which, which basically, if you follow this over, we we're just slightly higher than what they were back then. It's right around the same point, maybe a little bit higher than right now, but higher for longer back here was 12 months. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Now, the time frame I want everyone to focus on on this chart for purposes of the conversation about the housing crisis of 2008 is starting in 2000. This is the mortgage rates right here. And then we started into a recession in 2001 before 9-11. Okay. Mm -hmm. Important to understand that the recession had already started before 9-11 happened. And then 9-11 happened. And look what the look what the Fed did right here. So 9-11 is right about in here, right about here. So they were already dropping rates quickly. And by the way, just to point out, the Fed started dropping rates here and six months later, the recession. They started dropping rates here. Six months later was the recession. They started dropping rates here. And this is uh, about not eight months, seven or eight months later was the recession. So recessions always happen about five or six months after the Fed starts to drop rates, even after this higher for longer period. Mm -hmm. So they started dropping rates after 9-11. Rates went way, way down. Now, two of the other reasons, and that, that don't get talked about too much, but it, it all kind of went together. It's a very complicated conversation. 
because there are a lot of moving parts for why this happened. But the first one is back in the late 1990s, during the Clinton administration, they felt like how home ownership should be a right, not a privilege. Okay. And they encouraged Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to loosen up their standards on allowing people to, to apply for a mor mortgage or qualify for a mortgage. So that happened back before 2000. Now that by itself didn't cause the problem. Mm -hmm. The thing that exacerbated the problem was during the Bush administration, they relaxed all the regulations around mortgages. All right, so those two mm -hmm. things combined, keep that in mind because all of that happened, you know, Bush was 2000, they started um, loosening regulations and they accelerated that after 9-11. So they started loosening regulations around mortgages right around this time frame as well. Okay, so keep those two things in mind because that that was the beginning of the whole process. Now let me show you one more chart on the Case Shiller Housing Index and focus again on this period from 2000, which is actually where Case Shiller begins reporting. 2000 through 2008, where you can. 2008, here's the recession, 2008. You can look at this red line right here, which is basically where the moving average crossed the actual price of the house. Mm -hmm. So if you if you were to sell a house in May of 2007, you would have been selling at the top. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. But look what happened to house prices. House prices accelerated parabolically. Yeah. Went straight up. Now, the, the, there were a number of reasons for that. Um, one of the reasons was looser standards for mortgages. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons was there, the supply and demand situation. There were lots mm -hmm. of houses available at the time. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and a lot of people felt like it, it was a right to own a house. So a lot of people were buying houses even if they could not afford it. And by the way, the banks were encouraging them to buy houses and take out mortgages, even if they couldn't afford it. For sure. And one of the reasons for that, and one of the reasons a lot of people did it, is because they saw house prices in through 2005 accelerating up like this, and they felt like house prices will always go up. <clears throat> yeah, there was, there was truly a belief. I mean, I was in the game. I started in 2001. As you're right, as we got to 04, 05, I mean, every gathering I would go to, people were talking about home prices never go down. There was a general right. belief that that never yes. happens. Right. That's right. House prices will never go down. So get in, buy a house. In fact, the best way to finance your house is with an adjustable rate mortgage. Oh, dude, it was worse than that. It was that stupid garbage pick a payment two and 28 right. nonsense. Right. Oh, that stuff was terrible. Yes, exactly. So. Keep these two charts in mind and that, especially this time frame in through here. And now I want to go to, well, first I'll, I'll show you this one here. This is a very generalized view of what happened, but I'm going to get into more, a little bit more detail and I'm going to try to make sure we end this at the top of the hour. Okay. All right. So deregulation, the financial industry permitted banks to engage in hedge fund trading. I'll get into that in a second. That's we haven't talked about that yet. Banks demanded more mortgages because of this hedge fund trading, exactly. because of securitizing the mortgages. Banks demanded more mortgages so they could securitize them. Mm -hmm. It created interest only loans affordable to subprime borrowers. So the loans weren't high quality loans any longer. Yep. Right. So that's kind of what happened. So let me show you. And this is an article that I found, and I'm not going to read all of this, but I've I'm, I'm just highlighted some part. So catalyzed by the crisis in subprime mortgage-backed securities, the crisis spread to mutual funds, pensions, corporations that own these securities. So these, all of those mortgages were securitized mm -hmm. on Wall Street. And the reason, and what that means is Wall Street was taking the mortgages and bundling them together and creating, for an easy way of thinking of it, creating an ETF. Mm -hmm. All right. So an ETF is a bundle of stocks. You just buy the ETF and you own all the stocks. 
Well, securitizing mortgages is the same concept. They bundle all of these mortgages together and they sold that as a security that could be traded through hedge funds and mutual funds and pension funds and all of the rest. All right. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened right here. Logic follows that banks did not care if they loaned to borrowers who were likely to default since the banks did not intend to hold onto the mortgage or the financial products they created for very long because they knew those mortgages were going to be securitized. So they were selling the mortgages to Wall Street, to Wall Street yeah, well, Bank. Wall Street was a huge vacuum, just sucking more and That's more. Right. Of these. Creating mortgage-backed securities and collateralized debt obligations. There's some definitions of what these are, but basically think of those as ETFs of mortgages. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is what people thought was the reason for it, but these guys challenge that understanding. They find that financial institutions actually, actually sought out risky mortgage loans in pursuit of profits from high yielding securities like MBSs or CDA, CDOs, and to do so held on to high risk invest, investments while engaging in multiple sectors of the mortgage securita securitization industry. So that was the other issue that happened was Bear Stearns, Lehman, Merrill, Morgan Stanley, they were the biggest ones not only were they getting into securitizing these mortgages, but they were playing in every aspect of mortgage creation. Mm. They were lenders of mortgages, creators of mortgage-backed securities and collateral CDOs, underwriters of the securities and mortgage servicers. They were doing all, they were, and they were getting a fee for every single one of these. Right. That means financial institutions enter the market to lend money to homeowners and became the servicers for those loans. They were also able to create new markets for securities, MBSs and CDOs, and profited at every step of the way. When the conventional mortgage market became saturated in 2003, now remember the timeframes we talked about, the financial industry began to bundle lower quality mortgages, often subprime mortgage loans, in order to keep generating profits from fees. By 2006, more than half of the largest financial firms in the country were involved in non-conventional MBS market. Mm. Now think about that for a second. More than half of the largest financial firms, these are not mortgage companies. Right. These are financial institutions. More than half of them were involved in non-conventional MBS market or creating ETFs of bundled mortgages some of which were good mortgages and some of which were terrible, awful mortgages that they knew they were going to default on. Yep. All right. Financial institutions that produce risky securities were more likely to hold onto them as investments. In the summer of 2007, UBS held onto 50 billion of MBS and oh. CDOs. Citigroup had 43 billion. Merrill had 32. Morgan Stanley had 11 billion. Since these institutions were producing and investing in risky loans, they were thus extremely vulnerable when housing prices dropped and foreclosures increased in 2007. Now, what happened here was they were securitizing these mortgages. So the companies that were making the mortgages were selling them to Wall Street. Wall Street was creating these ETFs. Some of those mortgages were bad, but they couldn't separate them. They couldn't right. extract the bad ones from the good ones. Yep. So when some of them started to default, the whole package defaulted. Yep. All right. And to, to make it even worse, because back in 2003 is when a lot of these um, subprime mortgages were starting to happen, by 2007, all those people that had those subprime mortgages that said house price, housing prices will always go up. So I'm going to take yeah. out an arm. And by, by the way, I can't believe they even gave me a loan. Yeah. Some cases people didn't even have income. Yeah. They were getting loaned. They they had terrible credit. Fraudulent activity leading up to the crash was widespread. Mortgage originators co commonly deceived borrowers about loan terms and eligibility requirements, some cases in concealing information about the add-ons. Banks gave risky loans, such as Ninja, a loan given to a borrower with no income, no job, and no assets. And jumbo loans, large loans usually intended for luxury homes to individuals who could not afford them, knowing that the loans were likely to default. <clears throat> now, at that time, you have to think about what was going on. Housing prices were going up so fast, and everyone had the impression that they would never come down. Mm -hmm. So they said, this, this is great. We want to give these kind of loans out because we want these people to default. 
because we'll just go in there and take the house. And six months later, it's going to be worth more yeah. than when we took it over. So we don't care if they default. We'll just take the house. The houses always go up. Wow. So there's no risk here, right? Whoops. Large firms encourage their originators to engage in predatory lending, often finding borrowers who would take on risky non-conventional loans with high interest rates that would benefit the banks. In other words, banks pursued a new market for mortgages in the form of non-conventional loans by finding borrowers who would take on riskier loans. Wow. And the borrowers were ecstatic. Yeah, they, couldn't even, get... they couldn't even believe they were getting the loan. Right. I mean, I remember people buying three and four or five houses that mm -hmm. I'm scratching my head going that this person is just a, a server at the local restaurant. Right. What the heck's going on? Mm -hmm. Because large firms like Lehman and Bear Stearns were engaged in multiple sectors of the MBS market, they had high incentives to misrepresent the quality of the mortgages and securities at every point along the lending process from originating and issuing to underwriting the loan. Now, one thing is that is not talked about in this article that was also happening was the um, companies that were um, giving, you know, ranking, ranking the mortgage rating agencies, rating, rating, rating agency, the rating agencies were the ones that were supposed to be looking at these mortgages and saying, these are bad borrowers. Yep. We're going to rank this as a, as a D level mortgage, but the rating agencies weren't doing that either. They were in collusion yep. with these banks. Yep. So they were looking at the, these ETFs and, 40% of it might have been subprime and 10% of it might have been good loans. And they were saying this is an A rated security. Yep. yep. Right. So that was the other issue. So CDOs, multiple pools of mortgage backed securities, subject to ratings from credit rating agencies to indicate risk. So the, these are the definitions. But the rating agencies were not rating them correctly. And subprime, you know what that is. And the other interesting thing is the FOMC, the Fed. Mm -hmm. saw price fluctuations in the housing market as separate from what was happening in the financial market and assumed that the overall economic impact of the housing bubble would be limited in scope even after Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy. In fact, colleagues argue that it was the FOMC, the Fed's members' inability to see the connection between the house price bubble and subprime mortgage market and the financial instruments, which are the ETFs, CDOs, MBSs, used to package mortgages into securities that led the Fed to downplay the seriousness of the oncoming crisis. So oh, I love that last line, discuss separately rather than right. connected. They missed yes. it. Right, exactly. So basically this was a perfect storm. You know, why is it different from now? We, we now have stricter lending standards, more diverse housing options and a tighter regulatory environment in the financial sector have made the current housing market more stable. Current market supply and demand dynamics are also different with a shortage of homes driving up prices. These factors combined with the demographic and lifestyle changes suggest that the current housing market is less vulnerable to a crash than the market was in 2008. One key difference is the stricter lending standards that are now in place. Banks and other financial institutions are now required to ensure that borrowers have credit worthiness to repay their loans. And I think you know that. I think most folks out there know that they, you know, the banks are more attentive to your credit worthiness For sure, these days, yeah. much more than they were back then. They didn't even care back then. Nope. They, all you needed was a pulse and you can get a mortgage. That was it. Another significant addition, difference is the housing market crash and current housing market is supply and demand dynamics in the years leading up to 2008. There was an oversupply of homes fueled by speculative home construction and lax lending standards. This led to a glut of unsold homes and falling prices. Now, those old unsold homes and falling prices, in addition to um, overbuilding, mm -hmm. was also a result of a lot of people just walking away, just dropping the keys off at the bank, saying, yeah. I don't believe I don't believe you guys gave me the loan to begin with. Mm -hmm. I already had bad credit. So having my house foreclosed on is not a big deal to me. Here you right. go. And they just walked away. Yep. Jingo mail, Got that was called. Right. In contrast, the current housing market is characterized by a shortage of homes for sale, which is driving up prices. Pandemic has also created new dynamics in the housing market, with many people opting for larger homes in suburban rural areas. So, I mean, I, hopefully, <clears throat> I've got a couple of other kind of summary slides here. Housing prices were stable in the 90s, 2002 to 2006. Houses went up by 87%. Nuts. 
boom turned to a bust. The housing price declines and they decline because people were walking away and getting foreclosed on. Mm -hmm. By the third quarter, quarter of 2008, housing prices were 25% below the 2006 peak. Um, and then the low interest rate policy is what exacerbated this. In 2002, right after 9-11, the Fed dropped rates really low. So mm -hmm. not only could people qualify for loans that they weren't qualified for, they could qualify for them at a low interest rate or an adjustable rate mortgage, which they assumed we, they would live in the house for a year and it would double in price and they would just sell it, right? People really actually thought that. Mm -hmm. I remember selling my house in, two, I bought my house in Maryland uh, the day before 9-11. Oh, wow. The day before. I actually signed the contract on wow. the Monday before 9-11. Wow. And I still bought it, but I, I didn't think my house was going to, my other house that I had to sell was going to sell because of 9-11 and everything else. Well, it did sell, but within two years, it had doubled in price. Hmm. I couldn't believe it. Due to uh, rising inflation in 2005, the Fed started to push up interest rates. Now, this is the thing that's kind of similar to now that a lot of the people talking about a crash might point to, mm -hmm. that the Fed did push up rates, um, adjustable rate mortgages rose, default rate began to increase rapidly, default rate reached 5.2% during the third quarter of 2008. So yes, the Fed pushed up rates, which impacted these adjustable rate mortgages, um, and but, they, but the people couldn't qualify to begin with. So, right. so then they had... Uh, Collapse of the investment banks. The investment banks started to collapse because of those CDOs and MBSs. They had a bailout plan. Tre Treasury proposed $700 billion. Um, so the Treasury had to step in and basically shore up all of that. We were, we were on the brink of a 1929-type um, depression. Yeah. Because the whole – it was having a ripple effect. All of those big – investment banks like Bear Stearns and and Merrill and all the rest of them, all of their loans, you know, 50% of what they had were all defaulting. Yeah. So they had no money left. So there was all of the, the funding in the whole market, the whole country dried up. So we're on the on the verge of another Great Depression. Um so the, the, the mistakes of 1929, they tightened monetary policy, they restricted fiscal spending, and failed to enhance confidence in the banking system. It's widely believed that these mistakes exacerbated the effects of the depression that followed. Policymakers have learned from these, and I have to give it to Bernanke in this case, because mm -hmm. Bernanke, was, Bernanke was a student of the Great Depression. Yep. Yes, he was. And he understood all of these, these problems that they had back then. So... The, the lessons were put to good use during the credit crisis, during which the Fed provided enormous amounts of liquidity to the financial system. So that's the reason it happened. It's a very different situation today. There are some similarities today to what happened back then, but it, it's not anywhere close to what happened in 2008, uh, mostly because of the securitiza securitization of bad mortgages. Now, they still do securitize mortgages. Sure. But- they don't mix the bad ones with the good ones and the and they don't have 40% bad ones mixed into their right. bundle and they don't have um, the uh, agencies ranking them. Yeah, well, w one of the biggest issues that's really is a difference that nobody talks about is in 2005, 51% of originations were arms. Yes. And a lot of those were two-year arms, which meant right. they reset into a rising rate environment in 07 and they went from affordable to non-affordable because again in 05 the banks would underwrite you with the current payment they were not forced to underwrite you by the maximum payment again a huge difference today right um you know so yeah i mean you differences. can you can uh see here the case shiller the black line is the actual case shiller line so yeah right here 2003 2003 is when it really started to take off uh, and then through 2005, everyone was doing arms. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I have friends who said, yeah, I'm, I'm buying a house, but I expect to sell it in a year. Yeah. Double Just my get money. an arm. Yeah. Right. So they would get I an remember. arm. Which, which, yeah. which, which works fine until it doesn't. Right. Mm -hmm. And right up here in 2006 is when it stopped working. This You can see this little line. You can barely see it. This little line, the case shell from about 
uh, that's probably April of 2006 okay. to about April of 2007. So for about a year, prices began to decline. That's that's when the issues started to crop up. Yeah. Because all, all those mortgages during that 2006 to 2007 period, that's when they started to default. Exactly. And prices started to decline. But then when it dropped off a cliff, nobody was ready for it. Yeah, I, I remember this. I was buying before, during, and after. So I remember this is like PTSD for me. I remember this. All of this I remember is crazy. The good, bad, right. and the ugly. Right. Hopefully this gave an education to your listeners of what really happened back then because it was a very complicated, intermixed. There were so many different pieces of the economy that were involved in this. And it was a yeah. perfect storm about how everything happened at once. Yeah, I love that one line from the article that they they treated them individually and didn't see them being connected. That that was right. a huge miss and really exacerbated the problem. So, right, Dan, I appreciate you, man. Show the uh, website one more time. Yep. Uh, let's see. Here you go. Breakpointtrading.net. Uh, go out there and register if you want a reminder. The newsletter's for free. You can just download it from the website. Uh, all of, all the charts that I show is. There, you have to be a paid member for that, but it's only $99 for a year. So it's not much, but there's a ton, a ton of uh, content out there. And more and more stuff coming every I week, add, it seems. I add things every week, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. I appreciate you. All right, have a good weekend.